Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Yonit Arthur. I'm an audiologist and strength coach. You are on The Steady Coach, and today we are going to be talking about the factors that speed up or slow down recovery from medically unexplained chronic dizziness symptoms, such as those related to PPPD or 3PD, MDDS, vestibular migraine, and many of the other conditions I talk about here on my channel. One of the most popular questions I'm asked, and for good reason, is how long is it going to take me to recover? And this is a topic that's really, really hard to cover here on my channel because the results vary so much. So today we're going to dig into some of the factors, both that you may already be thinking about and those that you may not be thinking about that are going to affect the speed of your recovery either speeding things up or slowing things down. And for each of these factors, I'm going to try to give you some ideas about how you might be able to use this to your advantage so you can recover more quickly. So the first factor that speeds someone's recovery up is whether that person really gets this approach and this approach resonates with that person. So this approach being the idea that what's happening in your brain is a reversible brain prediction error. In other words, that there's nothing horribly neurologically, physically wrong with you. While the symptoms are real, they are the result of a reversible and non-dangerous brain error and that you can fully recover from this. I've covered this in great detail in other videos, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it today, but in short, because neural circuit dizziness is the result of brain prediction errors that are being caused by danger mode in the brain, in other words, that your brain is associating danger with movement, with the sensations themselves, with other stressful factors in your life. If there's a continuing danger response, if there's a continuing danger signal from you believing that there's nothing you can do to get better, that can really impede recovery. So the more quickly people are able to let go of the preconceived notions that they've heard about from their doctors, from other healthcare professionals, from various social media groups that say they can't recover or they're gonna be sick forever, the more quickly those people are able to recover. However, of course, there are many other factors that go into how quickly someone recovers. And number two that I've identified in my clients is the need for family and social support. And I cannot overstate this, your nervous system does not exist in a vacuum. I know that in many modern cultures, we think of ourselves as islands and that it's all about us and how we're handling our own stress, but human beings are social creatures. We are affected by the nervous systems of the people around us. So first and foremost, having people supporting you creates safety for your nervous system. And we talked already about the fact that danger mode or a perception of danger is what leads to neural circuit symptoms in the first place. So having a safe and regulating family or friend group around you is an important component in the speed of someone's recovery. Now, I'm not saying that you can't recover if you don't have social support. I'm saying that this is a factor that I've noticed in my clients and the ones who have the best social support are the ones who tend to get better the fastest. But there's more to it than that. People who have good family and social support, I've observed, have an easier time both feeling their feelings, which I've discussed in previous videos is a really big factor in the recovery from chronic dizziness, and also in change. Not just habit change, but in the kinds of fundamental changes that some of you, maybe not all of you, are going to need to make in order to make permanent changes to the way that your nervous system processes danger. So an example here of the kinds of change that I'm talking about would be if someone had the tendency to not say no to people, 
had a tendency to take on a lot of responsibility and want to say yes all the time, that person might need to make a fundamental change in the way he or she relates to himself and others in order to be able to set the kind of boundaries that he or she needs in order to be healthy and well. That is going to be a lot harder without good social and family support. And as I stated previously about feelings, it's going to be a lot harder for someone to be honest about his or her feelings and really express and be aware of them to the degree to which this is appropriate in a relationship if the relationship is not supportive. And on the flip side of how positive these things can be for someone, I have seen people with neural circuit dizziness whose primary source of danger mode in their bodies and brains was a hostile interpersonal relationship. So this goes both ways. Supportive friends and family can be a huge factor in speeding up your recovery, but unsupportive or actively hostile friends or family can play an active role in slowing your recovery down. Now, before I move on to the third factor, I want you to remember a term that you learned from one of my interviews that I will link to below called negative attribution bias. So there's a difference between a family member or a friend being actively hostile and unsupportive and you perceiving that person as hostile and unsupportive because of past experiences that you've had. When you have had lots of previous experiences of people being unsupportive or not being caring, you are more likely to perceive other people as being unsupportive and not caring, even if those people are trying to be supportive and caring. So my advice here is to be honest with yourself about whether a person is truly being unsupportive, which by the way, does happen and could be the case for you, or if you're perceiving that person that way because of past experiences. And if that's the case, if the latter is the case, this is something I've seen people work through in a really nice way by journaling. So set a timer for 20 minutes and start jotting down all of the times that you can recall in your life when someone was seemingly unsupportive and uncaring. And it's going to take you back. It may take you a few sessions, but it's going to take you back to the roots of those beliefs. So a couple other suggestions if you want to bring friends or family members on board. I have a video for loved ones that I will link to below. I have a video for healthcare professionals that you can give to therapists or healthcare providers. I will link to that below. And in my membership community, I have a small workbook for loved ones to help teach them a little more about what neural circuit dizziness is and what that person can do to help you when you're having a hard time. The third factor that really affects the speed of someone's recovery is that person's willingness to change. And you have probably noticed this among the various interviews I've done with our success stories here on my channel. I'll put a link to that playlist in the video description as well. The more quickly you are able to accept that there was something in your old life prior to dizziness that wasn't working for your nervous system, the more quickly you're going to be able to know what changes might need to be made to make sure that you live a healthy life in the future. And I wanna say here that a huge part of this change process is also making space for the grief that you feel over the loss of that old life. So we can both look back on that older version of you who ended up having a nervous system that was really in danger mode and say, yeah, that wasn't working for me, I need to make changes here, while also holding space for the fact that you've lost that old person by developing neural circuit dizziness. People have to work their way through that grieving process in order to make meaningful changes, lasting changes. And grief can be really difficult because many people associate grief with negativity and they worry that they're gonna get stuck in a negative thinking cycle about this. But holding space for your feelings is different from getting caught in a negative thought cycle. And I'll refer you to my video on emotional processing also linked to in the video description if you wanna learn more about that. But I wanna leave you with this. Grief is neuroplasticity. Grief is how your brain works through the experience of a loss so that you can make a new life moving forward knowing that something has been lost or changed. 
So that is an essential part of you being able to make changes within yourself. Now, beyond all that, the kinds of changes that people often make as they're recovering from chronic dizziness are those that relate to the kinds of internal pressures they were putting on themselves. So whether that be perfectionism or taking care of others or always saying yes, or always needing to be the best, being super competitive, being an unapologetic go-getter. So again, there's nothing wrong with being a high-performing person or being a kind person, but the way that we approach that, our internal dialogue with ourselves, when we're punishing ourselves for not reaching a certain bar, when we believe we have to reach a certain bar in order to be worthy, those patterns need to change. And correspondingly, our behavior on the outside needs to change. All of those things, you may ask, what does this have to do with neural circuit dizziness? Those take a lot of internal pressure off your nervous system. When your nervous system is under less internal pressure, it will not be driven by danger mode all the time. And this will lead to a resolution of the prediction errors that are causing your symptoms. And number four is closely related to number three. A big factor in how quickly people recover is their willingness to engage in meaningful self-care. So we're not talking about spa days and naps, although those can certainly be a part of self-care, but a true development of appreciation for themselves a true sense of self-compassion, putting themselves first before helping others. These again are all things that turn that nervous system danger mode signal down. And I see this pretty much universally in my clients who make it through to the other side of neural circuit dizziness. They are fundamentally kinder to themselves. And there is no greater message of safety than you being kind to yourself. So again, remember, this is all about trying to turn that danger signal into a safety signal, and that affects the speed of your recovery. And number five is someone's ability to work through difficult traumas, or other difficult life experiences. Now, I wanna be clear here and say that just because someone has trauma or difficult life experiences doesn't mean it's going to take that person a long time to recover. In fact, I have seen some of the fastest recoveries ever among people who had horrible childhoods. So just because someone had trauma does not mean that that person is gonna take years and years to recover. But if someone has never worked on trauma, if someone has been skating by without ever having dealt with past difficult experiences or difficulties in early childhood, then there may be a little bit more stuff to work through and that can change the length of someone's recovery. My advice to you here is that if you've had a lot of trauma or if you've had many difficult experiences and you have a lot to work through, I want you to really think about this work that you're doing as part of bettering yourself and setting your nervous system up to be healthy in the long run. It's not just about recovering from neural circuit dizziness. So a little sub factor here is that when people start to work on those traumatic or difficult experiences and they see it independently of the work they're doing to heal from neural circuit dizziness, that outcome independence, which we've talked about, helps them recover faster. So in other words, when you're doing something for the betterment of yourself rather than to get rid of symptoms, that also speeds up your recovery process. And number six is how well is that person dealing with stress and other outside factors? So this of course is a little bit related to how we deal with internal stress because as we've talked about, no one here lives in a vacuum, but if someone has ongoing really awful outside stress, like a job that person hates, a hostile relationship or some other situation that is really difficult, it's gonna make it harder for the nervous system to believe that you're safe. I've had questions and comments on my channel asking me, hey, I'm in an abusive relationship right now, what can I do to recover? And of course, there's a lot you can do to try to send yourself messages of safety, to be kind to yourself, to give yourself more space in your life. But if you're not able to effectively work through the stressors that are causing the nervous system danger signal in the first place, that is going to make your recovery take longer. Okay, so now that we've covered the primary six factors that I've identified among my clients that seem to predict the speed of recovery, although of course there's a ton of individual variability, 
I want to talk about the factors that I do not think affect the length of recovery. And number one is how long you've had your symptoms. You have the same nervous system as someone who developed symptoms six months ago. You can recover whether you've had it for 13 days, 13 months, or 13 years. As I stated previously in this video, some of the fastest recoveries I've seen have been in people who've had it for decades. And especially having had it for decades, sometimes this can be an advantage because people who've had it for a while are less afraid of their symptoms sometimes. So they don't have to worry so much about the fear component of their symptoms. This is not true for everyone, but for some people it is. That all being said, of course, when someone's had it for a long time, there is a grieving process that that person often needs to go through in order to move on into a next phase of life. And having lost many years to chronic symptoms can be a lot to work through. So of course that can affect the speed of someone's recovery, but purely the amount of time that someone's had it, nope, you can recover and I don't care how long you've had it. Number two is the intensity of symptoms. And I'm so happy to say this because I have seen people be unbelievably debilitated and recover very quickly. And I've seen other people have relatively mild symptoms and kind of limp along, not feeling great, but not feeling awful and take a long time. So how intense your symptoms are has absolutely nothing to do with how long it takes you to recover. It is all about how well you are able to turn the danger signal down in your nervous system. And that has nothing to do with the intensity of symptoms. I know the symptoms can be really scary when they're intense, but they can be equally scary when they're mild and they're only affecting one dimension of someone's life. And in fact, when someone has intense symptoms, frequently that person will notice a huge improvement relatively quickly because the bar is relatively low. So when someone goes from being bedridden to being able to take walks, that is so obviously a huge leap of progress that that person feels motivated and feels really positive. And that momentum, that inertia carries that person forward. Whereas someone who has milder symptoms, the changes are gonna be a little more gradual, a little more subtle, and it can be really hard to keep going in those situations. And the third is a little tricky, but the third factor that I believe does not affect the length of someone's recovery is how stressful that person's life looks like on the outside. And I've talked about this in previous videos, but really stress on the outside has of course some kind of effect on you, but most of what we're concerned about is how you are reacting to stress on the inside. Two people can have the exact same experiences and have completely different levels of stress on the inside. And the example that pops into my mind while I'm talking about this is caregiving. Caregiving is stressful. There's a lot to be done for the other person. There's a lot of emotional turmoil from caregiving, but some people feel a whole lot more shame and turmoil and conflicting emotions about their caregiving than others. And those people who, again, in many cases are people who've learned in previous experiences that their worth depends on being a good caregiver, have a lot more to work through in regards to the stress that has nothing to do with the actual stress on the outside, or at least has much less to do with the stress from the outside than you might think. Now, I'm not saying that, again, stress on the outside doesn't matter at all, but you have so much agency in how your nervous system responds to stress on the outside, that stress on the outside is not what I would call a predictor of the speed of someone's recovery. I hope that was helpful and gives you some ideas of what you could do to improve your recovery process and gives you some ideas of how long the recovery process might take for you. Most people, even in the absolute worst of it, will get better within a few weeks. By better, I don't mean you're gonna be where you wanna be necessarily, but there's usually enough of an improvement that people can start to be somewhat functional again. And that happens within weeks typically for most people once they're able to understand and grasp and accept this neural circuit dizziness diagnosis. But after that, the tail of recovery, the part where you really start to feel the way you wanna feel, 
that varies wildly from days to weeks to months. And yes, for some people, especially those who are dealing with many of the six factors that we talked about earlier in this video, it can take longer. So, so again, this doesn't mean that you're going to live the way that you are living today, but for some people, full resolution of symptoms is going to be a process that takes some time. Thank you so much for tuning in as always. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, please share it. Please subscribe to my channel. Please comment below with questions or comments you have. All of these things help me reach more people and I will talk to you soon. Bye.